Tori Vigfusion grew up in a herring fishing family on the north coast of Iceland. The collapse of the herring stocks knocked out the underpinnings of the whole community, and Ori's family had to move away. He went on to become a highly successful businessman with interests in distilling, banking, and tourism. But when the salmon seemed to be going the same way as the herring, Ori's memories of the herring collapse drove him into action. He concluded that commercial salmon fishing should be ended, not just in Iceland or in the great salmon feeding grounds off the west coast of Greenland, but everywhere in the North Atlantic Basin. And how? Mainly by buying up the fishing licenses of netsmen throughout Western Europe and Eastern North America, retiring the licenses, and finding other occupations for the fishermen to pursue. He built alliances, created the North Atlantic Salmon Fund, raised money, and pressured governments. 17 years later, he's 85% of the way to his goal. One guy setting out to save a great fish. If Ori Vigfusion can do that, what can I do? What can you do? My ambition is to uh, cover, to make commercial agreements in the, in the feeding grounds, in the migration route for someone, so they can travel, migrate throughout the North Atlantic range freely and always have a chance to come back to their home native river. Essentially to end net fishing in the North Atlantic, is that? Yes, yes, the end of, of net fishing and long lining. There was a lot, lot of long lining for salmon taking place in the Northeast Atlantic. The fairways operated these long lines. They were started by, by Danish fisheries, Danish fishermen from the island of Bornholm in the Baltic. They had the expertise, knew how to do it. And long lining is, is, a, is, a, is a very good way in a fishery to preserve the quality of the fish, you see. In Iceland, I live in Iceland because, because that is where I can have fresh fish to eat every day of the week. And we like it. We don't buy, f we don't eat fish, we don't buy fish that is caught in a net because that can be suffocated the fishing and so on. We buy fish that's been caught by long lining, you see. Because then it preserves the quality of the fish. Long lining, if they, they, they suffocate and also the, the blood of the fish may, may, may be stain, staining the flesh of the fish, you see. So, so we think it's not good enough quality. So. <laughs> That's a very demanding standard. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did this come about? How did it come about that you decided, one guy, initially, yeah. decided mm -hmm. that this, that, that uh, essentially commercial fishing of salmon in the North Atlantic yeah. should end? How did, how did you well, do the that? I, saw, I come from a herring family in the northern part of Iceland, just by the Arctic Circle. And we, in the 50s and the 60s, we saw the overfishing of the of the, of the herring. And soon, by 1967, there was no herring left. So we really destroyed uh, the vital, sort of the, 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 the diversity of the stocks, and, and certainly there was no more herring. So I have that in my blood. I know, so my family, we had to move away, and there was no more sort of uh, income to come get from the, from the herring stocks. So this is my background, so I know a lot about fishery. In Iceland, we uh, export fish for about $2 billion a year. There are 300,000 of us. So, so, so we know a great deal about fisheries management. We get it in the, in the morning newspapers, we get it in the breakfast news, and, and the television news. Every two or three hours, we are reminded of the news some elements on fisheries management, the quality of the fish, and so on. Uh, we have come a long way of organizing our fisheries in a way that it is managed through commercial agreements. I think fisheries everywhere should be managed by commercial agreements. I do not believe in governmental sort of uh, resolutions of this and that because, because every nation interprets that in a different way. Every little village interprets it in a different way. But if you have a commercial agreement, people usually stick to agreements. And, and uh, 
and that is what in sort of encouraged me to make commercial agreements for the fishermen because they would and all the agreements we've done I mean I have uh, it's it's virtually uh, total adherence to the agreements people respect commercial agreements because if 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 you violate the agreement it, somebody doesn't get paid you see because you only pay provided that the agreement is is uh, is fulfilled you see so that is and all the fisheries in Iceland my home country is managed by quotas very strict quotas uh, and every year based on scientific assessment every little boat or big boat is allocated the quota so many tons of caught so many tons of halibut, so many tons of herring and so on. And when that quota is, is fished, that's it. No more, no more fishing, you have to stop. And what happens is then that we start trading in these quotas. I buy your halibut quota, I sell my cod quota and we specialized and I fish my quota of that particular species when I know I have a very good market, you see. If the market is very high in September in Japan, that is when I quite catch my fish, you see. And, and so we have developed a so-called uh, 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 individual transferable quotas. So the value of our fishery is very, very, very high. And for instance, it's probably 30% more value of a fish caught in Iceland than in the neighboring country, Norway. Which, which has a different different system. And the European Union still has a, a, a different system. They have so-called effort limitations that you can only fish so many days a, a year. So the fishermen only go out when there's, you know, when there's best fishing. So, so th and they usually overfish. Fisheries management should be, man should be based on commercial agreements. It's the only way that works, you see. This gave me the impetus to say to the Greenlanders, to the people in Wales and Faroe Islands and so on, I will sit down with you, I fully, fully respect and recognize your right to the fishery. You have been doing this for centuries, you've been doing it, it's an heritable right. All I want to do is to sit down with you and try to figure out what I can do to make your income, make your lifestyle better, so you get more money for whatever you're doing. So if you are catching salmon, I will, and getting so much uh, value out of I will try to find you something else, like lumpfish, like snow crab, like shrimps, or whatever. And I will make you uh, uh, improve your, your income. This is what I do. If I can't help you do that, that's fine. We, and if you, if at the end of our negotiations you are not happy, you walk away. Nobody is hurt, and you keep your, your. But I would like to buy in the long term or in the short term your your salmon fishing rights. So about five thousand two hundred fishermen all over the North Atlantic now have signed up, and. And this represents about 85% of all the fish that used to be caught. And I think you will find them virtually, every single one of them is now happy. They have a better income, they have a better lifestyle, and it works. Now, let me make sure I understand this, because this is a really a, a remarkable piece of work and a remark based on some remarkable insights. Yeah. So, th so I have a salmon fishing, I have a right to fish salmon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to acquire that, but yeah. at the same time, you're also finding me other fish to catch, other yeah. markets to, to yeah. satisfy. Yeah. But are you paying me for the salmon I'm not catching also, year I after year? You can say that. I am, I am paying you to cease harvesting salmon, but I'm offering you a compensation, either a straight out cash, or more importantly, I will help you use that cast to redirect your boat in such a way that you get new equipment, you get new technology, new long lining and so on, and you will use that to catch other species 
other sustainable species. So, so I am better off because I get more salmon to go up the, the rivers for the spot fishermen and the rural communities to have more income from the, from the spot fishing. But you get more money, income, from the shrimp and the lung fish and whatever. And it could be any combination of that. It could be, it I, could be, I yeah. give you some cash and also I, I equip you for snow crab, yeah. that yeah. sort of thing? Or just Absolutely. whatever works for yeah. the individual yeah. fishermen? One lady in Iceland who had a uh, right to net, and she said, but Ori, I don't want any of that. You know, my interest is in cows. Okay, I said, what do you want to do with the cows? And I said, she said, maybe I can open, you know, make cheese and open up a cheese shop. Okay, she said, let's help you open up a cheese shop. And she's now been, you know, 15 years running a cheese shop and doing very well. Plus, she has, a, has uh, the compensation package, uh, some of it sort of stashed away, and, and that gives an, an annual income, you know. I mean, it's, uh, it's, so a, it's a win-win situation, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very individual, right? Yeah, yeah. So whatever it takes whatever to get me take, to, or yeah. to get a fisherman to stop netting salmon or, yeah. or long-lining salmon, yes. that's yeah. what you'll do. Yeah. Some of them read that into sport fishing, few of them and you know they become fishing guides use their boats for taking people out you know spot fishing deep sea fishing or whatever and, and so on so on the it's a it's a, it's a, um, I different most other organizations will simply want to ban the commercial fishing I mean I don't want to ban I want to negotiate so everybody gets a fair deal, you see. Yeah. And that, that, and that really is sustainable over, over the long term. Yes, way, yes. Yeah. Now this takes an enormous amount of money, doesn't it? It has taken a lot of money, yeah. Where does that come from? How do you... Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I, mean, I gather you're quite a successful businessman, but not that successful. No, 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 no. I mean, I, of course I paid for everything in the beginning, you know, and, and, uh, and but then it grew out of hand, you know, and, uh, but I have been, I have learned how to raise money. I'm still an unprofessional, and everybody thinks I'm doing it the wrong way. But somehow, I have always managed to, 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 to raise enough. I do it by talking to the river owners. Often they give me, you know, they come to a, a, to a project for a few years to raise enough uh, a pot. I host dinners around the world. I auctions and so on, receptions. I have. Uh, uh, film showings uh, uh, and whatever it takes, you know. But of course, mostly, you know, I I meet with wealthy individuals who are who are interested in in the salmon and the and the and the stocks and the environment and and I work work with them and and and, and they uh, you know make donations and you know I've ma raised you know. 50, 60, 70 million dollars this way. And, and, uh, I have to, just to maintain the agreements, I have to raise about five or 10,000 dollars every day of the year, you see. <laughs> I'm getting older and it's getting more difficult, you know, but, it, but I have become more and more successful on, you know, identifying the people who would like to sort of do this, you see. Do you, do you get assistance from governments at all? Very little. Mm -hmm. I did a partnership with the UK government when we bought out the drift nets in the North Sea. That was very uh, helpful. I mean, the Canadian government, they did it themselves. Remember, they bought out, they used commercial agreements to buy out the licenses in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and, uh, and we didn't have to raise any money for that. Uh, and, uh, and in Ireland, the, the, I lobbed it lobbied in Ireland for 17 years for the closure of the Irish drift nets. And in the end, the Irish government paid for it themselves with a lot of grants from the European Union. But I had lobbied the French government. You see, the Irish drift nets were taking not just Irish salmon, they were taking salmon returning home to France and Germany and in south of England, Wales and Spain. And, and, and the French government helped lobby in Ireland. And I think in the end, the Irish 
they didn't want to upset the friends anymore because every year the friends have to approve of the huge European grants going to Ireland. You see. At the moment, I am trying to lobby the Russian government because what is left of the mixed stock fishery, of the netting, is mostly a great deal of that is now taking place in the northern part of Norway, the areas called Troms and Finnmark, be be before Russian salmon come home to their rivers in the Kola. They crawl along the Norwegian coast and there are still a lot of nets, coastal nets there. So I'm doing the same as we did in Ireland. I'm now lobbying the, the Russian government and we've been quite successful because only last month we managed to get the Russian government, or not the Russian government, the, the, the Russian Security Council to take up this matter and they will be charging the, the Norwegian government for violating the United Nations Law of the Sea, which in essence, the spirit of that Article 66, the spirit of this means that one nation, if one nation is taking salmon from another nation, the nation of origin can demand a stop to that particular fishery. And 60 to 70 percent of salmon caught in the spring by Norwegian nets are salmon that are due uh, native to Russian rivers. These are the very, very, very big salmon, the big spawners that in May and June are, are returning home. And sort of the, the future foundation, the well-being of the Russian salmon means that they have to get these salmon back you know, to spawn. Yeah. Uh, uh, are those the salmon that are known as crocodiles? They're so big. They're like six-year salmon that have been out the sea at sea for six years and have become. Yeah. Well, normally uh, the sort of uh, Atlantic salmon they are two, three, four years, mm. up to five, six years in the rivers. You know, being a fry and a par and a small, and then they go out, and they usually most of them uh, they stay in the sea one, two, three. Yes, up to four or five years, mm -hmm. the very, very big salmon. The biggest salmon today are salmon coming into the rivers of northern Norway and into the northern rivers of Canada. The famous Karlovka River, the Rinta, the, the Yonkanka, uh, and, and, and Eastern Litsa. These are the rivers in the north and northeast of the Kola Peninsula, yeah, with very, very, very big stocks. Yeah. Yes, I, it's, it's fascinating because in, in Eastern Canada, you know, yeah. there are some, some stocks that just go for one year and they just yeah. stay in close to the Gulf of Maine and then there are the other mm -hmm. ones that go for much yeah. longer to Greenland and, yeah, yeah. and come back. Yeah, it's a, mm -hmm. You think of them as a single species, but there are all kinds of variety within the species. Yeah, I know. It's, and there are so many different subpopulations of someone. That makes it very, very complicated, you see. And, and uh, I mean, that is why we differ from scientists. The scientists want to study it all. If you have to study this all, I mean, you, you study them to death, you see, you can, there is, there is no limit to what you can break up a, a biological detail. It can be broken up and studied forever, you see. But at some point we have to say, I mean, my goal is to get more salmon back into the rivers, have the life cycle of the salmon working fully now, um, because we need more salmon in the rivers tomorrow, mm -hmm. because that creates more biology, more uh, the abundance of the stock, and it creates more, f uh, more uh, income from the local communities, and from that extra income, you can do then more science if you like to. But science must not interfere and slow us down, you see. And that is what they have sadly been doing for so many years, you see. Yeah. No, don't quite know enough yet. Um, Pardon? We don't quite know enough yet, and so it's, it, you postpone the no, action. No, but we know, yeah. why don't we do now what has to be done? Yeah. We, know, we know that a mixed stock fishery doesn't work. It's against common sense. It's against the you know, well-being of the stocks. So Now explain the mixed yeah. stock fi uh, yes. fishery, because what is that? Mixed stock fishery is where a fishery in the ocean is ta 
it can, it can be a net, it can be a long lining operation or a trap, where the net is taking someone from two, three, four or more rivers, because the net cannot control and only take someone from a healthy river, sustainable river. The net will take everything. It may take a someone from a very unhealthy river where the, the, the biological level is far below any safe, safe levels. That is why back in 1994 in Oslo, all the Samo nations got together and they decided that we have to stop all mixed dog fishery because we cannot control it, you see. Yeah. And that's where you've been particularly concerned. Yes, yeah. Sadly, the Irish are now trying to find a way of uh, reopening some of their fisheries by saying um, there can't be some mixed stock fishery that, that, uh, that can operate. Uh, and that is making the Greenlanders and the Faroes, the high seas uh, quota holders, mad because they say, why should we stop fishing for salmon when the salmon we save, when it returns to their home rivers, are taking on the coastlines in nets in Ireland, in Norway, and in Scotland. And, and, and it doesn't make sense, you know. You can always make up scientific formulas, you know, for more details and so on. So the danger at the moment is that this fight is going on. The Greenlanders are saying, no, we will, not, we, we will go back to commercial fishery because the salmon we save is slaughtered by, by, by others. And for instance, in, in, the, in the Faroese, they, they calculate how many salmon they have saved in the last 20 years. And they came up, that they, they had saved about one million salmon, returning them allowing them safe return back to the rivers and but at the same time the Scotland alone caught about 930,000 salmon so about 95 of every salmon uh, saved by the Faroes were caught in a Scottish net you see and that is why we uh, that is why the Nazca treaty will not work you see the Nazca treaty sets quotas only for two countries only for the high seas fishermen of Faroes and the Greenland. But their own netsmen at home, they can slaughter them all. They will never re you know, reach the spawning grounds, you see. You can't have an international treaty, you know, and, 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 uh, and saying one rule for you and another rule for me. You know. It would never work in the long term. So who's left? If you've got about 85% of the commercial fishing, yeah. it's essentially retired, yeah. who's the other 15%? Mostly in Norway, also in Scotland, coastal nets in various places in Scotland, mostly on the northeast coast of Scotland, in the Montrose Basin, in the north, uh, uh, very, very to top tip of northern part of Scotland, and also in, in Ireland, in the so-called foil district. This is the district where North and South Ireland meet. And there they have operated a, a mixed stock fishery. They, it has now been banned for four years because of pressure, our partnership, our friends in Ireland, and uh, were able to get through the European Union. There was a four year moratorium on this. And before that is up, we are now raising money to build the funds to try to buy them out before they reopen the visit. Mm -hmm. So it's Northern Ireland, well, that fall district, it's Scotland, and, but mostly in, in Norway. And it sounds as though the, the Scots and the Norwegians, from, from what I'm reading between the lines, yes. are, 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 are really quite determined to keep on doing this. Is, this, is that true? Uh, yes, they are, they are at the moment. They are, uh, well, the Norwegian government have, they have accepted. They have accepted that this is in violation. Whereas they are, while they are taking some from another nation, i.e. Russia. But they are saying there is a provision in the United Nations Law of the Sea also which provides uh, a, a sort of delaying process. 
and the Norwegian have used that. It's and they claim economic dislocation of their poor fishermen, i.e., we are such a poor nation in Norway, allow us to, to <laughs> of course, Norway is the richest nation on earth, you see. I was yeah. going to say, there was a time when that was true, it was a poor nation, but yeah. not, not, not in our anymore. time. No, 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 no. they are no. now the richest, no. richest nation. Yeah. Yeah. And they also have, um, they're also the originators of net pan aquaculture. Yes. Um, and, and now, tell me, who, tell me your views on that, because I yeah. gather that that yeah. can be seen as a real threat to wild salmon too, eh? Yeah. My fund, the North Atlantic Salmon Fund, we are primarily engaged. Our focus is the mixed dog fishery, the netting, providing safety in the sea for the migration routes. We also engage in other areas, like fighting dams, you know, and pu pulling down dams. Uh, we've been quite successful in some countries like that. Thir thirdly, we are trying to address the, 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 the agriculture in a way to promote a sustainability into agriculture. Most of the agriculture today is unsustainable because of various you know, the problems created by, the po by pollution, by parasites and, and so on, and the long-term uh, problem, of course, is the, probably the, 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 the escapees creating a genetic uh, sort of uh, uh, mix and so on, which could be that. So, but that is not our focus. There are other conservation partners we have who are focusing on that, you see. And in Norway, we, my, my, uh, the North Atlantic Salmon Fund in Norway, they are, they, we raise money to and fund a campaign in Norway for the sustainability of that of, of, of the agriculture industry. Yeah. Of course, we would like what we would like to do is to see all agriculture stopped in the sea and moved in onto land, because on land it can't be controlled, but on the in the sea it can never be controlled. There will always be escapees, parasites like the sea lice. The sea lice problem in Norway is principally responsible for the fact that 110 rivers, summer rivers in Norway, are now closed because they are in such a poor shape. They've lost that many salmon yeah. in those rivers. We also lobby, for one more thing, we also lobby for sustainability and better management of the industrial fisheries in the sea. Fisheries for herring, for krill, for santil, and for, uh, for uh, capelin to keep that down. And, uh, but that is uh, also another very, very complicated subject because the data is so incomplete in, in order to make uh, sort of proper arguments because a vessel may be registered in Ireland, they, they, the ownership may be in Norway, and they land the catches in Scotland and so on. So it's, um, it's very, very difficult to do this. And, uh, and, uh, but that is what we have lobbied for. And in some years, we have been able to lobby for the reduction of the Sandhill fishery in the North Sea, and also the, the, the um, uh, uh, Capelin fishery around Iceland and so on. There's a new formula in Iceland that unless the stocks are calculated in excess of 400,000 tons, no, no capelin will be, quota will be issued, you see. But it is, it is but it's a mixed stock fishery, that is my campaign, you see. Yeah, yeah that's the core of it all, yeah. but, you see, but these other things are yeah, the, obviously put yeah, together. I mean, so. we, we try to help in that area. All the other th things, you know, that are to help sort of return some of stocks to their historic abundance. But this is what we have embraced. This is what we try to do. This is what we have been very, very successful in doing. And that is what we want to eventually, we, we need to create a capital fund that pays for this in the old time future. Because the high seas fishermen, they cannot sell it out in perpetuity, you see. No nation, I mean, like you guys in this country, you can't you cannot just sell out your oil rights and gas rights in the future, you know. So, so we have to come to agreements. We have to work with these people in Greenland and the, and the Faroe Islands and so on, and every year to, to uh, 
to help the fishermen, to help the people who have the historic rights to the fishing. Well, yes, and it's clearly not sustainable to have to be raising five or ten thousand yeah. dollars a day in perpetuity. Right? Yeah, That's I know. That, I know. <laughs> so that is why I need uh, I need right away I that need rich people to help. Me. Yes, <laughs> and you yes, and you need. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's where you need your capital fund, right? That, that will Absolutely. produce that kind yeah, of... Yeah. Well, well. But this has worked well for close to 15, 20 years. And we are now sort of reassessing where we stand and so on. And, and of course, I'm getting older. I can't do it for many more years and so on. And are you surprised at the success you've had? Well, I in the beginning, I thought this would only take two or three years. You know, everybody would see it my way. <laughs> but then I slowly realized that nobody saw it my way. <laughs> okay, and, uh, but I was able to convince a lot of people, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I am actually now happy with the success. And I am happy that the, the, um, this philosophy is winning ground. I mean, we have been asked to take a look at the mackerel issue, the tuna fishing, and so on. Because, because everybody is now saying, why don't we do it for more species, you see? Yeah. That was a question I wanted to ask you. Is, yeah. is, this a, is this a model that can be used? And maybe not even just in fisheries. Is it a model that might be used in other areas? Forestry, for well, example, uh, or something like that? I, I'm sure it's already used in forestry. I, I mean, and, and of course, it is, um, it is used in you know, pollution you know, pollution quotas and so on, that has started. Uh, uh, we have started giving advice to others, you know. Uh, uh, but there have to be other organizations set up to do that. I mean, the, my organization is simply for, for the salmon, you know. It's, um, well, it's a spectacular story. And, it's, it's a, it's, and it's, this is volunteers only. Nobody in my organization, except one secretary, gets paid. Everybody has to do is, you know, on his own free will, and and um, and um, that doesn't get paid. How many people are involved? Oh, I have hundreds of people involved. It's about yeah. sort of maybe you know fifty to hundred people in in all the countries, and I'm working in I think fourteen countries altogether. You know. And that's a trick too, to be able to to, uh, to operate in fourteen countries successfully in very different yeah. countries too. Yes, oh, very, it's very it's different true. attitudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we are very, very, very. I mean, we have countries. This year, after sixty years, we had the first two salmon returning through the North Sea, up the River Rhine, all the way into Switzerland. After sixty years, two salmon came back to spawn. And also this year, seven salmon came back to spawn in the Czech Republic, of all places, up the Elbe system in Germany, and in over the border and into the Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Yeah, it's now, where are they? How how are they coming there? I yeah, mean, by stocking, you know, they you've stocked them. In yeah, the yeah. You, there were people who have stocked those rivers, and they are now getting returned. Yes, yes. So these yeah. wouldn't be the original salmon that would have been there. Before all the, um, uh, the industrial no, pollution no. and the dams and so no. forth? This we is we have found a very, very good strain of uh, stock in the, in, a, in, a, in the rivers of Denmark. They have been very, very, and they seem to be of similar sort of uh, genetic integrity as that used to be. And, and they are mostly using that in Europe now. You know. And more and more now are people are using the... the, uh, the uh, uh, the Peter Gray method of stocking. This is a, a method that was used in stocking, very successful. The, the, the biggest success, stocking success story in the world is the Peter Gray in the River Tyne that empties through into the, into the North Sea in the northeast of England, goes through Newcastle. That river was almost virtually dead 40 years ago, but Peter Gray's stocking method uh, was employed there, and last year we had 60,000 salmon coming back th through the fish counter there, and 5,600 salmon were caught on a rotten line. And we are now using this same methodology up in Maine. I asked them in Maine, look, give me a river in North America, which we I want to try this stocking method. And they selected the river Maine. I told them, any the worst river you can think of. I just want a river. 
And we started that one year ago, and we are now about to, to, re, uh, to uh, release 65,000, the most beautiful, healthy-looking par you ever saw in North America. The, the same good quality as virtually as the, as the, as the wild par going. And uh, Peter Gray, I have sent him over five times to, uh, to monitor, to set up all the technology up on the, on the East Machayas River. And, and uh, we are not 100% sure this will work, but I, we think this is the best thing that can happen there. The river is virtually dead or someone. And when you have a dead river, I mean, the only thing you can do is stocking. I mean, of course, we try everything else first. We use the natural stock of the river. That is the thing. But when you have a dead river, or you have a river that is so low in, in stocks that diversity cannot work, you have to use stock. And I, we have now, we would like to make this as a sam example for the next five or 10 years and for other rivers to copy if it works. And we are pretty confident that it, it may work, you see. What's Peter Gray's system? What is, what's different about, the way, about his way of doing it? He, it's mostly, he, he raises, he, he, from, from egg to par, he raises them very carefully in a, in, a, in a sort of new way, trying to utilize the natural water, the, 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 the hatchery is built on the river. So we have the same water going through with the same insects coming through with the water and so on. And every, he does it in a way that uh, as natural as possible. You see, over 90% of, uh, of eggs or fry or what the result from eggs die in the year one. That is what he is cutting out, this mortality during the first year. And and then he releases the, the, uh, the par, five, six centimeters, into the river about this time of the year, in late October or, or November, when the water temperature in the river uh, goes down to five degrees Celsius or below five degrees, because then all the, 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 uh, the par, they stop taking feeding. And, and, and when they are in the rivers, they are then there is no competition with wildlife in the river, you see. And they lived, used, they, they then are conditioned in this cold environment to live together until next spring or next summer when the temperature comes up and they, they start feeding again. This is, the, this is his methodology. He's written a book about this. And you should see that book. It's very, very... Uh, I, I will have it sent to you. Thank you very much. I it, it, is a, it, is, um, it is, I hear that a lot of biologists now have been, have been, who've been working on this, they are, all, they are now all looking at them and they all like what they see. You know, they are all confident that this is certainly, probably the best way to proceed. Uh, it's spectacular to think that we've got to the point where there are, are even a few salmon going back up the Rhine and back yeah, up the I Elbe. Know, know, you know, those those uh, incredibly yeah. polluted rivers. Yeah. And the t yeah, yeah. But what you tell me about the Tyne is truly yeah. astonishing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. My, my only worry with East Machayas is that it's global warming and it is getting you know, quite warm up there. We, we, it's, it's the, the salmon like a cold environment. They don't like, and, and the river is much higher. I think it's almost on the same level as Madrid in Spain, you see. It's, it's uh, uh, I fear for the, for the heat, you know. What's going on in Spain? Because the, the salmon, <coughs> did, you know, know. we did have salmon rivers in Spain. Are, they, know, st are they still productive at all? They are pro they are, the, in about two, three, four hundred years ago, there was a huge amount of salmon coming to the rivers of Spain. And they were, they were, they are all situated in the northern part of Spain, flowing north into the Bay of Biscay, the, the river Esva, the river uh, Narcea, the river uh, Seya, the, the many beautiful rivers up there. 
they were all virtually extinct, and and uh, and they were down to to every year now they cut about I think 500 up to 3,000 salmon a year, and uh, they are big supporters of NASF because oh, they're, they're salmon. They know they, it comes to Greenland and Iceland. You know they need protection there. Uh, sadly, the the um, we have introduced a lot of catch and release, uh, uh, fly only and so on. Uh, sadly, we had a, a, a governor of Asturias, president of Asturias, who banned all this. He said, <laughs> just kill everything and so on. And uh, He's now been voted out of the presidency, so we are slowly coming back into, uh, into better methodology and regulation. That's what's happening there. We have been working a lot with the people in the Pyrenees Atlantic region that runs into the, in also into the, in the Bay of Biscay. We have slowly been, we have, we have uh, leased their netting rights in June, July, and this year we have started buying some of them out forever. The fishermen there, the used commercial netsmen, they have been uh, fishing for salmon, uh, but also most of their income has come from from Pipal, the uh, the, uh, uh, the eel fishery, the baby eel fishery, very 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 valuable fish, and uh, and uh, and there is more and more production now of of par and juveniles in the rivers in the in the Pyrenees Atlantic. The river is called Dugaf. We have been working with uh, the French government a lot over the last ten years. And, and in the Pyrenees Atlantic region, but also in Normandy, where you have rivers called uh, the Saloon and the Sea, and the, it's there where the French government agreed to pull down two huge dams to allow the salmon, you know, free access back up the rivers and so on. This is a terrifically encouraging story. I mean, it's a hard-won battle. It's taken an enormous amount of time and effort and money and so forth, but mm. it actually works which is really I very, so. yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Now, one of the things that you've also said, mm -hmm. and I'd like you to tell us a little bit about, is mm -hmm. that you see the salmon as a major economic resource for the rural communities that mm -hmm. uh, they touch on. Tell me yeah. how that works. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the every year, every, everywhere, people are fighting to create more jobs in rural areas, you know. The jobs, of course, always come to the big cities and so on. And uh, what can we do to, uh, for the rural areas, you know, and uh, and salmon is can be very valuable in that respect if if it is in abundance because we get a lot of we get a lot of spot fishermen coming to fish the premier rivers. This is what the governor of Murmansk said last month when I met her, and she agreed to help get this uh, matter to the Russian Security Council. You know, it's it means a lot for our you know the people who live in the in in the Murmansk area, you know. Uh, the, I, think, I think it's about the same size, same number of rivers and same ma maybe the catches in Russia as in Iceland. In Iceland we have uh, about 80 or 90 salmon rivers. We catch about 50,000 salmon, 50, salmon a year, 60,000 salmon a year, and it creates jobs for about 11, 1200 people. So it's a lot of Lot of income and, and the the value of the of the uh, the economic value uh, of the industry is about 150 million dollars. You see, so it's a lot of lot of money for you know for, for this. So if you catch 50,000 salmon, are these yes. 50,000 salmon catch and released by sports fishermen, or are these yes. 50,000 salmon that are caught, brought ashore, and processed? No, no, they're all caught in Iceland. It's, there's no commercial fishery. It's, uh, we bought up the last remaining nester in the about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it takes about 40, 40, 50 salmon to create one job. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's all. You know, it's so valuable. You know. Now, why is it so valuable? What, what, where does the money come it's, from? I mean, because the people come and, and they pay money for to coming. You know, it's an angling tourist industry. Yeah, so. And you're and and. And it's very expensive in, in Iceland, too, yeah, it's right? Yeah, it's too expensive. Of course, our job is to get more and more salmon coming back and mm -hmm. um, to bring the prices down so more of us can afford to, 
<laughs> so the expensive, the fact that it's so expensive reflects the scarcity of salmon. Absolutely, not, yes, yeah, yes. And, um, and what does it cost? If I, if I want to go fishing salmon in, in Iceland, I'm not a salmon <laughs> fisherman, but if yeah, I were, yeah. and I wanted to go and fish in Iceland, what would it cost me? I think it is sort of the basic price. You start about $500 a day. Yeah. And, and, and $1,200 are uh, normal for better rivers in, and for the very, very premium rivers, it, it costs up to about three, four thousand dollars a day. A day? Yeah. Now where does that money go? Who gets that money? The, the, pe the people who own the rivers. Okay. So the, the rivers themselves are actually Yeah, owned. it's... Yeah. In Iceland, Norway and Scotland, we have a private ownership of the summer resource. Nothing to do with government. The, it's it belongs to the landowners, to the land adjoining the rivers, and all the income. That is why, uh, that is why everything we do in Iceland, for instance, is all done by the private sector. The government hardly does anything. Because, I mean, after all, it's a private industry and then it's private resource. They have to, they get all the income, but they have to pay all the expenses. It's very different from the North American system, you know, the, the, you know, the, the property of the common. Well, in Nova Scotia, yeah. where we're from, uh, anybody can fish salmon if there's salmon there to be fished. Right? Yes, but yes. There's, no, yeah. there's no restrictions. But I think in New Brunswick, it's more, it's more your style. I think the yeah. Miramichi, for example, mm -hmm. has private salmon and angling yeah. rights up, uh, up and mm -hmm. down the river. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe a different story. Okay. Um, You've said you b you're a believer in green capitalism, and I yeah, guess yeah. We've, been, we've been talking <laughs> about that, but yeah. tell me a little more about green capitalism, because I think there are an awful lot of people who are green who yeah. think that capitalism is the problem. Yes, well, I see. I mean, I have, I have used my, my fund is re really a green capitalism. You know, we would like to restore summer stocks, and, and, but we, we do it by brokering agreements between the stakeholders. So one stakeholder, he gets out of business and gets a new business away from the salmon, something sustainable, but the salmon for him was unsustainable. So that is how we, we, we buy and sell, you know. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is in essence what we're doing, brokering deals, you know, between one group of stakeholders and another group of stakeholders. You know. the, other, the, other, the other one I want to ask you about too was the, in, um, the individual transferable quota. Yeah. Because I think we had that in Canada with the codfish and nevertheless we lost the codfish. Are you sure? Well, I think uh, we did. I think that there was, uh, after the Kirby Commission, I think that's yeah. the way the fishery was mm -hmm. organized. Yeah. And, and you would think that that yeah. would be, uh, that, that if I have an, uh, a quota like that, yeah. it's valuable, I would be very interested in preserving the stock because that mm -hmm. preserves the value of the quota. Right? Sure. But yeah. it seems as though we had that and nevertheless lost on the mm -hmm. codfish, and I've never quite yeah. understood how mm -hmm. that worked. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, I don't know about the... Uh, the system in Canada, mm -hmm. I, I must admit. Mm. See, I, I, I thought, I, I don't think it was freely transferable. I think... Perhaps not. Uh, yeah. Perhaps not. Uh, yeah. See, I guess one of the things that I'm saying to myself, mm -hmm. how is it that Ori in Iceland yeah. is doing all this, uh, this wonderful work? Yeah. Uh, and partly I wonder if it's the long memory of a little European country that's been there doing this kind of, mm -hmm. dealing with these resources for thousands of years, you know? And, and I think the short term, yeah. and this may be the, the issue of green capitalism too, mm -hmm. is that the capitalism these days seems to be a very short term thing. I mean, catch it, make the next yes. quarterly yeah. report, mm -hmm. and drive yeah. the stock price out, sell it and get out. There's mm -hmm. none of this thought about the, the long distance future, but that may be built into the genes of a country like, like mm -hmm. Iceland, that you know, yeah. you, there's not much there to be drawing on and you've figured out how to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, well, the story goes that, that Iceland, who came from Russia and Norway, and, and, and they are 
one Norwegian king was taking over all the kings and, and <coughs> after he was successful, he, but he owed so much money that he had to pay for it. And, and his advisors told him to send out some, uh, some uh, tax bills, you see. And so he sent out the tax bills and everybody who could read and write left the country, of course, you know, because they do, didn't want to pay the tax. Um, there is a lot of sort of capitalist element in the, in the Icelandic way of thinking, yes, yeah. And um, uh, we are a very small country, but, you know, but we have to, I think we have to embrace capitalism just as much as, as, uh, as socialism, you see, you know. And uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, you know. We had the biggest crass of any country in the world, you know, but we'll probably be the first way up again, you know. And that is... Um, but there again, you didn't do it the way everybody else did either. Right? No, that's true. <laughs> that's <laughs> you took true. quite yeah. a different path. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, which obviously works. Mm -hmm. uh, one final question yeah. is: or is um, you have among your supporters is the Prince of Wales? Yes, yes. How did you get the Prince of Wales aboard? Uh, I had just started, and I had uh, contacted a, fr a friend who used to fish in Iceland a lot. Uh, his name was uh, is Lord Tryon, who used to be a very good friend of the Prince of Wales. And he told me he, had, he would support me and so on and, and um, after I started. And then suddenly I had a call from him and saying that the Prince of Wales wanted to meet with me. Because 10 years earlier, the Prince of Wales had been writing letters to the British government to Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister at the time, asking him to address the netting of salmon in Greenland. So when he heard about my methods, he, he, was, he was delighted. Somebody was finally addressing this, you see. So Lord Tryon said, next time you come to London, I will organize a meeting. And I met him, and he's been a great supporter all the time. You know, he, uh, uh, Every year he does something for me, you know, maybe writes, uh, hosts a reception or a dinner or, or he, will, he will write a forward to a book or something. And he's very, very supportive. And, uh, and uh, uh, he, used, he used to fish in Iceland, of course, you know, quite a lot. And he still fishes in, in Scotland every year. He fishes in the, on, the, on the River Dee and the Balmolar beach and so on. He's very, he's very keen. And, and that's fascinating. I mean, yeah. But he saw this problem on yes, his own yeah. years before you Yes, before everybody, anybody else. Yes, yeah. 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 He's, he is he's very clever. He's very, uh, and of course, very green. My other big supporter is, of course, Paul Walker. You know, oh. Paul Walker, who, oh, yes. who the, the, the uh, Federal Reserve. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The yes. most famous banker ever, you know. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. 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 Now, how did he come into the picture? He heard about the green capitalism. He likes, he likes using money in a good way, you see. You know, um, he's a guy who wants to stop the bank taking, you know, using all the money for speculation, you see. He said, well, you know, when an old lady get, puts her money in the bank, that money should be safe. Banks shouldn't speculate and say to the lady, I'm sorry, we lost it all. You know. and it's, uh, yeah, I just, I just had breakfast with him. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Every time I come to New York, I have a long meeting with him. I come to fish with us in Iceland, too. You know. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, he's a very, very good supporter of, uh, of, of the salmon yeah. course. You know, yeah. you know. Well, allies like that have got to yeah. be pretty critical yeah. to, the, to yeah. the success of the whole thing. Oh, I've right? had a lot of the, the Bass family in Texas, you know, President Bush. He used to fish with us in Iceland. Uh, the uh, Jack Nicholas, the famous golfer, a uh, lot of lot of nice people around the around the world. You know. But I mean, I, I, sadly, I get all this credit, you see. But there are a lot more people who do, you know, a great deal of the work, you see. You know, so. yeah, mm -hmm. But, but you do still have a salmon uh, a fishing um, business of your own, right? Is that right? Yeah, I ha yeah. I have a little. Uh, I have. I'm the chairman of four fishing clubs, and so I'm the operate fishery, you see. 
two of the clubs is just for, uh, for you know, uh, social clubs, but two of them as a business operation, you know. And we make money from it, you know. That's how it should be done, you see. Yes. <laughs> okay. Everything should be done, you know, in a, in a, in a, uh, for profit, you know, mm -hmm. because otherwise, the, you know, the operation will die, you know. Yeah. In a way, that's a sustainable, that's a test of sustainability in, right? in, in social enterprise. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things that we've had, and I, yeah. uh, I diverge here a little bit. We've just done a, a bunch of work on salmon aquaculture, as I think yeah. you know, and we'll be talking about that tomorrow. But, mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that the aquaculturists say is you can't put their clothes, the grow Atlantic salmon in closed containment on the land because it isn't profitable. Well, I mean, that has been, I think, proven, I mean, uh, this new methodology they're using in Virginia, I have great faith in that. You know, they say that they can produce someone profitably, you know, at, at about the same price per kilo as they do in Norway, you know. Uh, let's hope they're right, you know, let's hope they, um, because that will change the whole story of the agriculture industry because instead of producing this, you know, up in the north, in Canada, Iceland, and Norway, and so on, they would be producing it in New York. They would be producing it just outside Paris, you know, where the market is, you see. So that, the other, the other uh, methodology will be put out of business, you see. If, if this is, if this is a, 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 a long-term profitability. You know. mm -hmm. So your vision in that case would be, that what I mean, the, the, what, what the government and the companies are saying in places like Nova Scotia is this is rural development. This produces jobs. It produces yeah. profits. It keeps the economy rolling around. Mm -hmm. But your answer to that would be, that could very well go to New York or Paris. Yeah. And what you, if we, what you had then was wild salmon. Absolutely. You'd be better off. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think what we can do with we are now in two places in Iceland. We are trying to develop it in such a way that the fishing lodges are used for fishermen in the summer, but for uh, s the skiing industry in the winter, you see, to use the same facilities and so on. I think we will see a lot of that in the future. You know, people come skiing and staying in the fishing lodges, you know. It makes good sense. It makes beautiful sense, you see. <laughs> yeah. Ori Vigfusion one of the great conservationists and one of the great examples of our time. If you were inspired by Ori's defense of the salmon, you may want to hear more about Paul Watson's defense of the whales, or Diana Beresford Kroger's defense of the forests, or Jane Goodall's dedication to the chimpanzees. You'll find them all on the Green Interview site. For the Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>